Each year, the elite of college baseball descend on Omaha's Rosenblatt Stadium to determine which team will be crowned NCAA champion. Only the most rugged can survive the rigors of the regular season, the conference, and regional tournaments and claim one of the eight prestigious spots in the biggest tournament of college baseball. It's a nine-day extravaganza filled with great players, great coaches, and most importantly, great teams. It's a tournament full of pageantry, fierce competition, emotion, where some dreams are realized and others broken. Judges around third. Will he score? Here's the throw to the plate. He is out of there. What a great throw by Audley. It is the College World Series. This is the 1991 College World Series Highlight Show. This highlight show is brought to you by Wilson, maker of the official ball for NCAA Baseball Championships. From the time youngsters start watching and playing baseball, they dream of one day being in the national spotlight. For the young men who have made it to the collegiate ranks, they point towards a College World Series. It's the ultimate, even in the wake of many individual accomplishments. Omaha, big time stadium crowds, national exposure on CBS and ESPN. All eyes are focused on college baseball's best who are living out a dream. This is one of the greatest thrills of my life being here. Uh, I remember growing up watching this when I was eight years old. You know, I used to come down and watch USC play. I used to go down to Dado Field and watch them play, and always watch them on the World Series. So, I mean, it's just a thrill being on this field. It's really great. You come here, you play against great competition. It's like the ultimate tournament. You know, all during the year you play tournaments, and uh, this is like the ultimate one. And the people are great here. It's a great atmosphere, a great park. It's just a dream come true. I haven't been here since 1980, uh, running out of time. It's, uh, it's a great feeling. We're very proud. All the guys are thrilled. Most of our parents are here, a lot of people from Clemson, and, and uh, well, I, hope they just have, I just hope we can have a good show today. You know, ever since I was about six years old, along like the rest of my teammates and all these guys out here, all you ever want to do is come to the College World Series, and, uh, well, we're here now. We're going to make the best out of it and uh, see how we do. Well, I can remember growing up with my dad and after church, you know, spending a Sunday afternoon watching a World Series game, and I always thought about how, my, how nice it would be to get there, and that's the reason I chose a Division I school to go play baseball, and uh, now I'm here, so it's a dream come true, definitely. It's something that uh, you'll treasure for the rest of your lives. There's guys I talked to that uh, the, the first time I was ever here was in 1975 as an assistant coach, and there's still guys I get together with from that, that team, and... Uh, that's uh, usually the forefront of the conversation is the experience of playing in the World Series. Of the many coaches and players who come and go from college baseball, only a select few are privy to the College World Series experience. And it is an experience of a lifetime. More than 270 teams opened the season with hopes of playing in Omaha. 
But by the time the finishing touches were being put on Rosenblatt Stadium for the big show, only eight remained. And for the fans of Omaha, this one was special. For the first time in 40 years, their hometown heroes, the Creighton Blue Jays, had qualified for the World Series. Joining the Blue Jays in the 18 field were the number one seeded Florida State Seminoles, making their fifth appearance in 12 seasons under head coach Mike Martin. The second seeded Clemson Tigers brought a remarkable 60 and 8 record to Omaha under 34 year skipper Bill Wilhelm. Seeded third, the Wichita State Shockers, winners of the 89 College World Series, posted another 60 win season under head coach Gene Stevenson. The four seeded LSU Tigers, whose powerful combination of pitching and hitting brought them to the series for the third straight season under coach Skip Bertman. The Florida Gators, the fifth seed, led by coach Joe Arnold, won 25 of 29 games down the stretch to make their second appearance in four years. The sixth seeded Long Beach State 49ers, led by Dave Snow, turned their program around quickly to reach Omaha twice in the last three years. And finally, the A-seeded Fresno State Bulldogs, guided to its 15th straight winning campaign by coaching Hall of Famer Bob Bennett. As the 1991 College World Series was about to commence, the consensus was that this was the most even and most unpredictable field in tournament history. The balance of the 1991 College World Series teams was evident right off the bat as the opening game pitted number one Florida State versus number eight Fresno State. However, it was not a true picture of the highest seed against the lowest seed, as the Bulldogs were starting collegiate baseball's player of the year in Bobby Jones. But Jones was facing a power hitting team that ranked as one of the nation's top offensive clubs. The early innings were dominated by Jones and Seminole sophomore Roger Bailey along with a bevy of outstanding defensive plays. Florida State held a one to nothing lead after four innings on Kenny Fielder's second inning double. But the bottom of the Fresno State lineup then took control. The sixth, seventh, and eighth spot hitters loaded the bases on Brian Judas' single, Grant Brown's double, and a walk to Chris Falco. That set the stage for catcher Vernon Spearman, batting ninth in the Bulldog lineup. And here's the pitch, line drive down the right field line. It's in for a base hit, and it's going to go all the way into the corner for extra bases. The go-ahead run is in. Here comes the third run. On his way to third is Spearman. The play will come to the plate. Not in time, a triple by Vernon Spearman, and the Seminoles trail it now 3-1. to one. Spearman then scored the fourth run of the rally on Philip Romero's RBI single, giving Fresno State a 4-1 to one lead. An inning later, leading 4-2, to two, Fresno State's lower third went to work again. This time, the big hit went to Falco. An inside pitch hit high and deep to left field, going back as Chris Roberts to the wall. This ball is out of here, home run. 6-2, to two, Fresno State as Chris Falco, the leading home run hitter for the Bulldogs. Florida State's Ty Mueller brought the Seminoles to within three in the seventh inning. This solo home run, his 11th home run of the season. But after that, Jones was nearly unhittable, mowing down 12 of the final 15 batters. And with his dad looking on, the junior pitching ace put the finishing touches on the Seminoles. The 91 series was underway, and Bob Bennett's Bulldogs had set the tone for anything to happen. Game two saw the Southeastern Conference's Florida Gators and Louisiana State Tigers square off for the seventh time of the season. 
LSU won the first four meetings, but Florida beat the Tigers twice to win the SEC tournament just two weeks before. And the Gators were full of confidence with starting pitcher John Burke, one of the country's best, who was coming off a no-hitter in the regionals. But the Tigers, who had played in Omaha more times than any other team over the past six years and yet hadn't won a national title, were poised and ready to make sure 1991 was a different story. The Tigers wasted little time in making a statement about their purpose. Junior All-American Lyle Mouton, LSU's leading hitter on the season, crushed a first inning Burke pitch over the wall in dead center field. LSU's celebration was only beginning as Mouton's power stroke would become contagious. Meanwhile, LSU starter Paul Bird allowed just one hit through the first three innings as the Tigers clung to their one-run lead. In the fourth, the Gators put together their first back-to-back -back hits. And Herbert Perry's double and Brian Purvis's single. Bird remained in control, however, trading two outs for the tying run. It didn't stay tied long as LSU quickly went to work. Mouton again led the hit parade, opening the Tiger fourth with a single. A pass ball and a wild pitch set up Gary Hemel's sacrifice fly to score Mouton and tie the game at one. Then, designated hitter Pat Garrity muscled up to give the Tigers a 3-1 lead by hitting just his second home run of the season. LSU started Chad Auger, who didn't start game one after pitching a regional final three days earlier, relieved Paul Bird and continued to shut down the Gator bats. As the game moved into the bottom of the seventh, the Tigers were looking to pad their three-run cushion. It all started with a walk hit batsman and a single by Armando Rios to load the bases with nobody out. With Mouton up next, Joe Arnold elected to bring in his hard throwing stopper, John Pritchard. It was power versus power. Mouton's second home run of the game put the Tiger contingent into a frenzy. and put an exclamation point in an impressive 8-1 LSU victory. Game 3 featured the hometown Creighton Blue Jays in the school's first ever College World Series game against the highly favored and power-hitting Clemson Tigers. The hoopla and the build-up for this game had encompassed the city of Omaha all week. And now the home crowd was ready to cut loose on Rosenblatt Stadium. But could the Blue Jays handle the moment, standing room only crowds, and a week's distractions? I think so. I think if we can get off to a good start and, and not try too hard to please the city of Omaha and the people that are here, uh, I think we'll be very tough to beat. Uh, the whole key, I think, for us is if we can handle it emotionally and channel it in the right direction, and I think we'll be, we'll be awfully hard to contend with if we do that. But let's not forget their opponent, the Clemson Tigers, who simply boasted college baseball's right, best record this season. Creighton ace right-hander Mike Heathcott answered the question quickly, stifling the Tiger hitters in the early innings. The Blue Jay bats began answering the rest of the question in the third. After a one-out single by Dax Jones and a walk to third baseman Scott Stahoviak, cleanup hitter Steve Hinton made sure there were no doubts that the Blue Jays had come to play. Here's a pitch, fly ball in the right field. It may hit the wall, it does. One run will score. Here comes Stahoviak. Hinton is heading for third. Stahoviak scores. Hinton has a triple, ladies and gentlemen. And the Creighton Blue Jays jump out in front. Two to nothing. Listen to this crowd. Creighton took its 2-0 lead into the fifth. And shortstop Bobby Langer started the inning with a drag bunt. Then with one out and one on, the Blue Jay Lightning struck. Breathing leads off a second. Angel and pitcher looks back to second. 
Line drive up the power alley. It's running between the center fielder and left fielder. Freeling scores. Stahoviak goes into second with a stand-up double. Stahoviak on second base. Funk waving his fist at the crowd. Here's the pitch. Fly ball off the power alley. It's going to hit the fence. Goes over the center fielder's head. Here comes Hitton. He may go for it, or Stahoviak's going to score. Hitton gets a double. Hitton not having really great luck in the regional. Here's the pitch. There's another fly ball up the power alley into right center field. Here comes Hitton. McConnell is heading to third. Here's the slide and here's the throw. When the dust had cleared, five Creighton runs had scored and the Jays held a commanding 7 to nothing lead. This was more than even the most optimistic hometowner could have expected. While the Blue Jay bats were sizzling, Heathcott had allowed just one Clemson hit through the first five frames. Still, everyone knew the Tigers would not go down without a fight. With one out in the sixth, ninth place hitter Jeff Miller and leadoff man Billy McMillan each single, starting Clemson's first threat of the game with their dangerous middle lineup coming up. Miller, the third baseman, is on its second. McMillan with the leadoff and Miller with the leadoff. Ground ball through the hole. Miller will score, and just that quick, Michael Spires with an RBI single. And Macrina steps in. Here's the pitch from Heathcott. Fly ball to center field. And a great catch. Did he catch it or did he no, drop it? Is. No, he didn't. The ball's loose. One run will score. Two runs will score right now. The Tigers' infamous murderer's row had struck again. And suddenly, the Blue Jay lead was just 7-4. to four. Heathcott and his Blue Jay teammates were determined not to let this fairy tale game close in disaster. Back by Hinton's diving catch. The Blue Jays worked their way through the ninth with more than 16,000 emotional fans chanting on every pitch. The host school had not just appeared in their first ever World Series game, they had won it. Game four pitted two of college baseball's most respected coaches, Wichita State's Gene Stevenson and Long Beach State's Dave Snow, both two-time National Coaches of the Year. After a one-hour rain delay, Wichita State leading one to nothing in the first inning took a two to nothing lead on Todd Dreyford's single to center, scoring Jim Oddly from third. Not to be intimidated, Long Beach State answered quickly in the top of the second. Ed Christian leads off with a shot to center. After Rudy Rodriguez walks, Willie Speakman singles to Tillman in left. But Christian is held at third to load the bases for Lamar Rogers. Steenstra is in a jam, the pitch driven hard, and Billy Hall can't get it. It's a base hit in the right field. One run will score, the others will have to hold up. The bases will remain loaded. That was a sharp line drive. Billy Hall with a quick start to his left. Jason Giambi's walk forces in Willie Speakman to tie the score at two. Now the bases are loaded again for Long Beach State's home run threat, Scott Telenoa. Here's the stretch, 2-2 two -two pitch. High in the air to center field. Jim Audley has a beat on it. He'll make the catch, the runner at third tanking. Audley's throw to the plate is cut off. It's 3-2 Long Beach State. That's the second out of the inning, but Long Beach State has taken a 3-2 lead on the sacrifice fly by Talanoa. Steenstra and Wichita State avoid an explosive inning and stay within one run of Long Beach State. The Shockers wasted no time getting the lead back as Jim Audley led off the third with a single to center. Audley then steals second, and Marabelli walks, and Mike Jones steps to the plate. Driven into left center again, thinking quickly it's going to find the gap. Going to go for possibly extra bases. Audley around third will score easily. Mirabelli over to third is a stand-up double for Mike Jones, and the Shockers have tied it up on Jones' second double of the ball game. Wichita State added another run to regain the lead at 4-3. to three. The Long Beach State answered to tie it again at 4. 
This seesaw battle continued until the bottom half of the fifth inning. Oddly at first, Mirabelli the hitter. Doug has grounded to second, driving in a run. Maxwell delivers, oddly goes. First pitch and Mirabelli drives it a mile to left field. Way, way out of here. Clear the back of the bleachers and the Shockers lead by a score of 6-4. to four. That ball was hit so hard that Brent Cooks and the left fielder just turned and watched. He never took a step back on the ball. It was over him almost before he could turn around. Boy, and I'll tell you what. Wichita State added four more runs to go ahead 8-4. But as the game reached the ninth, the 49ers were good for one final fling. Sophomore third baseman Jason Giambi narrowed the score to 8-5 and gave renewed life to Long Beach State with one out. After a Scott Talanoa single, Stevenson went to the bullpen and brought in his stopper, Jamie Bluma. A walk brought the tying run to the plate with still one out. But as he had done so many times during the season, Bluma closed the door. It wasn't pretty, but Stevenson and the Shockers would take it and continue on in the winner's bracket. As the College World Series moved to the loser's bracket, pressure mounted as teams faced the brink of elimination. Florida State's Mike Martin was looking to keep his top-seeded Seminoles from becoming the first team to exit the 1991 series. And they faced their intrastate rivals, the Florida Gators and Coach Joe Arnold. This must-win game featured an interesting pitching matchup of 19-year-old freshman Mark Valdez for Florida and junior Tim Davis of Florida State, a middle reliever getting only his second start of the year. The Gators took a 1-0 lead in the first inning when Herbert Perry, their top RBI man, rifled a shot past a diving third baseman, Mandy Serrano, to score Kevin Polkovich. But Valdez and Davis hooked up in a grueling pitching duel. Valdez allowing just one hit, and Davis just four through the first five innings. Finally, in the sixth inning, the Gators earned some breathing room when the middle part of their order went to work. With one out, singles by Brent Killian and Perry put two runners on for catcher Mario Linares, the Gators' leading hitter, who was still hitless in the World Series. This time, Linares came through. That's the Gators' turn. Killian at second, Perry at first, one out. No balls and one strike. The pitch. There's a line drive headed out towards the gap in right center. It's going to be dropped all the way to the wall. Picked up out there by Garrett Blanton. They're going to try and score two runners coming in right behind one another, and the Gators are leading three to nothing. Bases clearing double by Mario Linares. The two-run double made it three to nothing. Then the next batter, designated hitter Bo Camposano, tried the same gap in right center field. There's another line drive headed out towards the gap. It's going to go all the way to the wall. Gators are going to lead this one four to nothing. Blanton fields it out there, and it's two doubles in a row. Now trying to go to third is Camposano. Here's the throw. He is out at third base. The rally was cut short when Camposano was nailed at third. But the Gators still owned a four-run lead, and Valdez was cruising. The young right-hander wasn't pitching like a freshman in the big game rather with a poise and confidence of a veteran. As Valdez stormed ahead towards a complete game shutout. He allowed just three hits to a high-powered Seminole offense. For Florida State, it was the shocking end to an otherwise outstanding season. And for Florida, it was renewed life in her quest for a national title. First round winners Louisiana State and Fresno State hooked up in game six to see which team would continue on through the winner's bracket. Bulldog starter Robbie Seitz had the job of trying to tame the Tigers' hot bats. But in the second inning, LSU catcher Gary Hemel kept the Tigers sizzling when he hit his 22nd homer of the season to break the LSU single season mark held by former Tiger power hitter Albert Bell. After Pat Garrity walked, Johnny Telechia smokes a double off the wall and right, putting runners on second and third for Chris Moot, setting the scene for another explosive LSU display. But Bob Bennett didn't want this one to get out of control, so he went to the mound to settle sights down. 
But Skip Bertman's team was too hot to cool off as Chris Mook followed suit with a double of his own to the fence and right. That scored Garrity and Telechia and put the Tigers up 3 to nothing. In the bottom of the second, Fresno third baseman Chris Falco with one on proved the Bulldogs could reach the fence as well. It was his second home run of the series. The 3-2 LSU lead was intact until the fourth when the Tiger lineup began an assault on all parts of Rosenblatt Stadium. Tiger attack accounted for eight runs in three innings, including Hemel's second round tripper of the game and 23rd of the season that gave LSU a commanding 11-2 lead. And with lefty Mike Sorotka showing why he was undefeated in 10 decisions in 91, the Tigers went on to a resounding 15-3 victory and positioned themselves as one of the teams to beat in this College World Series. We feel good about winning the first two, but you have to win the third game, you know, to get to the championship game. This is our third time here for a few of us, and I think I think it's rubbed off on on the younger guys and some of the other guys that haven't been here. You know, it's it's not as exciting. You know, we've already been here. We know what's going to happen. We know what to look forward to. Now we want to win the championship. The Clemson Tigers had watched top-seeded Florida State get ousted a day earlier. Now Bill Wilhelm's second-seeded team was trying to avoid a similar fate. Their opponent in Game 7, Long Beach State, would like nothing better than to make this the first World Series where the top two seeds headed home first. After Clemson took a 1-0 lead in the top of the first, the 49ers set the tone for the game by coming back with three runs in the bottom of the inning. A single and stolen base by Kobe Cradle set the table for Mitch Kaler, who then singles up the middle to score Cradle. He advances on Kimbrough's error. Then, the 240-pound designated hitter, Scott Talanoa, unloaded over the left field wall for his 12th home run of the season. Kaler scored ahead of Talanoa, and Long Beach State jumps out to a first-inning 3-1 lead. The Tigers added one in the second. Then in the third, they grabbed the lead back when Joe DeBerry singled to lead off the inning, and Eric McCrenna stepped up and hit a towering home run over the left field wall at the 370-foot sign, scoring DeBerry in front of him. It was his 24th round tripper of the year. That made the score 4-3 Clemson, but in the bottom of the inning, the 49er power surge was cranking up again. Jason Giambi drives a triple over the head of center fielder Kevin Northwood. Mitch Kaler scores from second, and Giambi dives into third, setting off the 49er hit attack. Talanoa later grounds out to score Giambi. Then Brent Cookson tags another Mike Kimbrough pitch to deep right center off the glove of center fielder Kevin Northrup. Long Beach State powers to a three-run lead and thoughts of running away with a victory. But Clemson coach Bill Wilhelm replaces Kimbrough in the mound with Scott Miller to face Christian, who wastes no time joining in a power surge with a blast into left center in the vicinity of Eric McRenna's shot over the 370-foot sound. Two-run score, and Long Beach State goes up 7-4 after only three innings. These two teams pounded on each other until the score was finally tied at 10 in the eighth. That's when Bill Wilhelm literally tried to steal the game away. 
With a left-handed pitcher on the mound and runners on first and third, Wilhelm had Michael Spires break for home plate. As Joe DeBerry sees this, he heads for second. Todd Taylor, the lefty on the mound, reacts to the runner on first, and Spires steals home to give Clemson a one-run lead. This unusual twist of the double steal had worked all three times during the regular season, and the fourth time was no different. Long Beach State scores in the bottom of the eighth on the Ed Christian single as John Monchin makes it a close play at the plate to tie the game at 11. And the Tigers stranded two in the ninth, leaving the door open for a final 49er rally. Speakman's rare display of power. Just his second home run of the entire season put a dramatic and abrupt ending to a thrilling hard-fought battle. The Tigers packed their awesome 60-10 record and headed home. The 49ers, coming through time and time again, kept their dream alive. Game 8 featured the Missouri Valley rival Wichita State Shockers against the Creighton Blue Jays. Creighton's opening round victory had pushed an already euphoric city to even greater heights, and the fans of Omaha flocked to Rosenblatt Stadium and shattered the College World Series attendance record. 18,206 fans packed the stands, and many more were turned away. The Blue Jays were hoping to use the charged-up crowd to help them pass their longtime nemesis, the Shockers, who had won all previous six meetings in 1991. The Jays needed a quick start, and they got it with a little help. Mike Jones' throw to the bullpen in right allows Dax Jones to head into third on a three-base error. With leadoff man Dax Jones on third, crowd favorite Scott Stahoviak continued his toward hitting. A single to left scores a first run of the game and cranked up the meter once again. Steve Hinton kept the intensity level rising. There's a wide drive to left field, up the power alley. Stahoviak is going to stop at third. Here comes the throw into second base. Steve Hinton once again starts it off with a double. He was the hero in the first game with a double and a triple. Stahoviak's at third. Chad McConnell brought home the second round of the inning when he hit a sacrifice fly to right, scoring Stahoviak and the Creighton confidence was sky high. After the two-run first, the game turned into a fierce pitching duel between Creighton's Alan Bennis and Wichita State's Tyler Green. Green settled into the rhythm that made him one of this year's top collegiate pitchers. His much talked about knuckle curveball baffled the nation's top hitting club. Meanwhile, Creighton's cool and collected freshman wasn't about to take a back seat. Bennis mowed down the first 10 shockers he faced, and it took a Blue Jay miscue in the fourth to get the shockers ignited. Speedster Chris Wimmer reached base on an error by Scott McConnell at first. The stretch, Wimmer goes, oddly swings, and just inside the bag at first down toward the corner. Wimmer going to third. Gene Stevens is going to wave him all the way, and he's going to score without any problem. Hinton still trying to pick it up in the corner. Jimmy Audley into third base with a stand-up triple, and he is now just one short of the Shockers' single-season record. That is his 12th of the year. And the Shockers... In the only inning that Bennis was hit hard, Doug Mirabelli follows with a deep drive that was tracked down by Dax Jones in center. Oddly tags and comes across for Wichita's second run in the game. As the game headed into the ninth inning, the drama tightened even further in a battle that featured championship game atmosphere. Here's the pitch. Ground ball to the second baseman. He tags second, throws the first double play! What a play by little Mike McCafferty as he came across the bag himself and then threw on the first. But Tyler Green shut down the Blue Jays in the bottom of the ninth, striking out the side to bring his incredible total to 14, and the game went into extra innings. The knockdown dragout fight continued on to the 12th, with Audley on third and Jones on first. McLuhan hits a bouncer up the middle. Barty and Langer collide to stop the ball, but Audley scores to put Wichita up 3-2. It looked as if the Shockers were on their way to defeating the Creighton Blue Jays for the seventh time in 1991. 
but the Blue Jays were looking for a storybook finish against the stopper Jamie Bluma, who had struck out the first five batters since replacing Green. But Bluma put a potential tying run on first when Jason Judge was hit by a pitch to lead off. Pinch runner Steve Bruns went to second on a ground out, and the suspense encompassed Rosenblatt Stadium as Dax Jones stepped to the plate. Two balls and two strikes and one out. Judge leaves off second. Here's the pitch. Fly ball center field, base hit. Judge is around third. Will he score? Here's the throw to the plate. He is out of there. What a great throw by Audley. A great throw. Audley's perfect throw put a gut-wrenching end to Creighton's valiant effort. And with the final out, the Shockers had the feeling of champions. Simply put, it was a great night of college baseball. Two of the country's top pitchers faced each other in game nine. For the Florida Gators, sophomore John Burke was looking for his second win in the series. And for the Fresno State Bulldogs, Collegiate Baseball's Player of the Year, Bobby Jones, was going for his 11th straight victory. The two pitchers were in total control through the first five innings, allowing no runs on either side, and only one base runner advanced past second. In the Florida sixth, the number nine hitter, Ted Rich, led off the inning with a single up the middle. Then Florida coach Joe Arnold looked to manufacture a run. Dave Majeski attempts to sacrifice Bunt to advance Rich in the scoring position. Not only does he move the runner to second, but he legs it out for an infield hit. After Kevin Polkovich flied out, Brent Killian doubles off the wall and right over the outstretched hand of Brian Judas. Both Rich and Majeski score in a two-run double, and Florida finally gets to Bobby Jones to go ahead two to nothing. However, the Bulldogs weren't ready to lay down and quit. In the bottom half of the sixth, with Jason Wood on first, Todd Johnson dumps a single to right, putting runners on first and second with no outs. Fresno State has the perfect scoring opportunity if they can get to Burke. After Topher strikes out and Judas pops up to second, freshman first baseman Brant Brown delivered a clutch liner up the middle to bring Fresno State within one run. Neither team threatened again until the ninth inning. The Bulldogs were down to their final out when the Gators opened the door. Vernon Spearman was in scoring position after an error and a ball by John Pritchard. That brought Mike Noel to the plate, needing only a hit to tie the game. But Pritchard regained his poise, and Noel goes down swinging to end the ace seed's gallant tournament run, while the Gators, after an opening game loss, were still alive for a berth in the championship game. Game 10 matched the number six seed Long Beach State 49ers against the number seven seed Creighton Blue Jays. After the devastating 3-2 loss to Wichita State, the crowd was a bit subdued as they waited to see if the Blue Jays could bounce back. The Creighton fears came to surface in the early going as shabby fielding and wild pitching resulted in three Long Beach State runs. The drop ball by Dax Jones gave the 49ers a two-run lead in the first inning. Long Beach State picked up one in the top of the second, but in the bottom of the inning, Steve Hinton pumped life into his team and the crowd. It was enough to set off a ferocious Blue Jay barrage. Tim McConnell walks, and then Mike McCafferty blisters a hot shot past the diving Jason Giambi at third. Hinton and McConnell come around to score, and the Blue Jays had finally awakened to the delight of the hometown crowd. After Stahoviak's single to bring home Dax Jones and Jason Judge, Steve Hinton was back at the plate for the second time in the inning. Here's the pitch from Krogan. Fly ball over the left fielder's head, and I believe it's a home run! It looked like it was going to hit the top of the fence, but it didn't. A home run, and I believe that's the first home run for the Blue Jays in this series. 
The sudden and unexpected Creighton explosion took the Blue Jays from the depths of doubt to the festive feeling of confidence. Now with a 9-3 lead, Maloney's 92-mile-an-hour fastball had renewed zip. He teamed with relievers Darren Harris and Aaron Puffer to shut down the potent 49er bats the rest of the way. The Blue Jays had answered the challenge in a big way and earned themselves a rematch with conference foe Wichita State. Game 11 featured two familiar opponents, one of which will represent the Southeastern Conference in the College World Series title game. The Tiger locomotive had built up steam thus far in the series with two impressive triumphs and appeared tough to stop. But the Gators had regained momentum themselves after an opening round loss to LSU. But on the very first pitch of the game, LSU's Tukey Johnson set the tone for another Tiger onslaught. He drives a single to right fielder Brian Purvis, and the Tigers were off and running. Later in the inning, with two out and two on, Red Hot Gary Hemel started another episode of LSU Long Ball. He strokes a homer deep over the right field wall off of Florida lefty Cord Corbin. It was Hemel's 24th blast of the season, and it gave the Tigers a 3-0 lead and put Florida in the hole before they even got to the plate. The Gators couldn't afford to let LSU get too far ahead, so they scored two runs of their own in the bottom half of the first. Kevin Polkovich starts things off with a single to right, and Brent Killian walks. The Gators needed a hit from cleanup hitter Herbert Perry, and he came through with a single to right, scoring Polkovich from second. The third single of the inning came from another hot-hitting catcher, Mario Linares. It wasn't a three-run home run, but it pulled Florida within one and let LSU know that they would not roll over and die. The Tigers clung to their 3-2 lead into the fourth, then cranked into high gear once again. The inning started with Gary Hemel ripping a single up the middle. Pat Garrity walked, and Johnny Telechia drives a single past Herbert Perry at third, loading the bases for Chris Moop who could add to LSU's slim one-run lead with a hit. Mook does just that by hitting a drive to deep center field over the diving Brian Dubin, who would go for a double and score Hemel and Garrity to put LSU up 5-2. to two. After Sheets lines out to Polkovich at short, Tukey Johnson singles up the middle as he had done to lead off the game. Two more runs score, and LSU had blown the game wide open. The Tigers added one more in the inning and five more in the fifth, continuing one of the most awesome displays in recent World Series memory. The game was definitely in LSU's control as they led 13 to four. But in the sixth, Mouton added to his season home run total. This time, he hit a powerful shot off the top of the scoreboard, one that even Lyle and the LSU contingent could admire. Not to be outdone, Florida catcher Mario Linares hits his 14th homer this season over the 370-foot mark in right. It scored Brent Killian and Brian Purvis to cut the Tiger lead to 16-7. But LSU and Gary Hemel were not finished. In the top of the ninth, Hemel took aim at the scoreboard in left. His fourth homer of the College World Series just missed his target, but cleared the way for the real celebration. A 19-8 victory and a chance to achieve their ultimate goal, to play in the 1991 championship game. Coming off a thrilling game just three days earlier, the Wichita State Shockers and Creighton Blue Jays were matched again in a chase of the championship game spot. A shocker win would send Gene Stevenson's crew to the title bout for the second time in three years. Because of the double elimination format, Jim Hendry's Blue Jays would have to win this game, then beat the Shockers again the following night to reach the championship game. Over 17,400 fans packed the stands, second largest crowd in College World Series history, next to the first Creighton-Wichita State confrontation. 
Wichita State's Kenny Steenstra with a 16-0 record. And Creighton's Mike Heathcott at 15-2 started the game in dominating fashion until the Shockers broke the ice in the third inning. Chris Wimmer got things started with Wichita State's first extra base hit of the contest. He rips a double inside the line past the diving Scott Stahoviak, setting the table for Jim Audley, who used his arm to gun down the Blue Jays in the first meeting. This time, he used his bat to give the Shockers a one to nothing lead. But the Blue Jays responded immediately after Rick Freeling singled to lead off the fourth. One out later, Steve Hinton put runners at the corners with a base hit through the hole. The next batter up, Chad McConnell, hits a sacrifice fly to deep center field. Freeling trots home to tie the game at one apiece. Mike McCafferty was next with a chance to give the Blue Jays the lead. One ball and two strikes on McCafferty. Hinton still at first. Steenstra gets a sign. Here's the pitch. Fly ball left field, base hit. Hinton's around second. He's heading for third. Into second is McCafferty. Hinton is coming in and score. Here's the throw to the plate. He's in there. Creighton is ahead. Two to one on a two-run double. A one-run double by Mike McCafferty. But Wichita didn't let the Creighton fans celebrate for long. Going into the bottom of the fifth, leading 4-2, Mike Jones looked to put the Blue Jays away for good. The pitch to it. High drive, deep to left, looking toward the foul pole. If it stays there, it is there, it's gone. Mike Jones with his first College World Series home run, and Wichita State jumps in front 6-3, and Jonesy has come through with three big runs batted in tonight. Led by a red-hot Mike Jones, the Shocker scored five more runs in the seventh on their way to an 11-3 route of the Blue Jays. And Wichita ends the Creighton fairy tale one chapter too short. But the Blue Jays had given their hometown supporters a week they'd never forget. And the Shocker's reward was a chance for another national championship. Both Louisiana State and Wichita State had gone unscathed through four regional games and three College World Series games to reach the big show. The Shockers relied on great pitching and defense throughout the 1991 season, and now Gene Stevenson's team was ready to repeat their 1989 title. The Tigers, making their first ever championship game appearance, had been a part of the last three College World Series, but finally were in a position to win it all thanks to an unrelenting offensive attack. This was a classic confrontation between Wichita State knuckle curve phenom Tyler Green and the LSU power tandem of Lau Mouton, Gary Hemel, and the rest of the Tiger lineup that was hot top to bottom. It was 1-0 LSU without a base hit when designated hitter Pat Garrity made the Tigers' first hit good for a 2-0 lead. With Hemel on first and Mouton on second, Garrity singles to left, scoring Mouton on a close play at the plate. But the Shockers were the masters at manufacturing runs, and they did just that in their half of the first. Billy Hall singles to left to start off the inning. He wastes no time in an attempt to steal second. There he goes, and Wimmer takes outside, throw down, not even close. Billy Hall steals second easily. And even less time in going to third. Good lead by Hall from second. Breaks for third, pitch high and outside, throw down, he's in there. Hall's aggressive base running along with Audley's chopper down the first baseline gets Wichita on the board. But the Tigers went to work again in a second with two outs and Tuki Johnson on first. Armando Rios was up next. Mouton and the Tiger long ball specialists were right behind, but Rios stole the show. 3-2 pitch, hit in the air to center field. A lot of room out there, but it's hit deep. Oddly on a long run, and it is gone. Armando Rios with just his fourth home run of the year, a line drive that didn't appear to be hit that deep, and it just kept carrying. And it's out of here, close to 400 feet from home plate, and LSU leads it by a score of 4-1 to one here in the second. 
After giving up the home run to Rios, it seemed Green had settled into a rhythm until the fourth inning when he walked the first batter, Andy Sheets, and Gene Stevenson went to his bullpen and used Darren Dreifert to try to keep the deficit at three. But Skip Bertman's Tigers were determined to keep the pressure on. A hit batsman and a walk set up Cordani's knockout blow. Oh, one delivery. Swing and a well-hit ball to right field. Right fielder goes back. He won't get it. It'll go all the way to the wall. Run one and he'll score. Here comes Mouton around third. Here comes Cordani. He'll deep for third. Lions in and he's safe. A two-run triple and LSU has taken a 6-1 to one lead. LSU continued to hit, but Wichita just didn't want to stay down. They got a run in the bottom of the fourth, and then in the eighth, Tommy Tilma greets Oje in the top of the inning. Pretty well hit ball to left field. Bojani going back, Rios going back at the wall, it's gone! Tillman sixth home run of the season, and Irv, all of a sudden, you can see the Wichita State team come back alive. But the life was taken from the Shockers by relief pitcher Rick Green, who retired the next three batters he faced, and only Jason White stood in the way of the LSU goal. He is one out away from the national championship for LSU. Here's the pitch to White. It's a little tap down the third base side. Boots got it. Throw to first, and LSU has won the national championship. It had been a brilliant College World Series for Skip Bertman's entire team. Their explosive bats set series records by averaging 12 runs per game and tied another record with nine home runs. The defense set the series record for fielding percentage with just one error in four games and, of course, several outstanding pitching performances. The Tigers had gelled at the right time and powered their way to the pinnacle of college baseball.